Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm Michael Hirshhorn. This is Driving Sustainability in Furniture and Design. Join the change. So uh, we're waiting for people to sign on. And in a second, we're going to ask you some fun polling questions. All right, so Ali, can you put up the first polling question? These are just some fun questions to get us going. Enjoy this, the spirit. All right, so first question. How much furniture and design-related waste does New York City generate each day? First option, all, uh, <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, almost a thousand tons. Second, a lot. Third, a whole lot. Fourth, too much. And uh, fifth, all of the above, even though it's not at the bottom. <laughs> all right, make, your, make a pick. Um, Ali, can you move all of the above to the bottom? So unfortunately, it, it just puts the highest graded one at the top. So the one with the most uh, that people have selected will automatically move to the top. Okay. A couple of technical uh, glitches here. And can we see the, the, the polling results, Ali? Yes, we can. So right now we have 50% uh, of people have said all of the above, 20% of people have said almost 8,000 tons, 20% say too much, and 10% say a lot. If, if you navigate to the um, chat, the sidebar, and hit polls, you'll see all of the results pop up. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Interesting. I only see the um, the options. I don't see the polling results. All right, let's go to question number two. All right, so circularity in furniture. This is in the spirit of fun of the day. Circularity in furniture most often refers to, first, a sofa and armchair surrounding a coffee table. Second, emphasizing reclaiming, refurbishment, and reuse of furniture. Third, circularity in furniture most often refers to round tables. Fourth, various furniture outlets ringing a shopping mall. And fifth, circularity in furniture most often refers to a dizzy or spinning feeling after reclining too long in a recliner. Submit your vote. I think you need to vote as well if you'd like to see the poll results. Oh. Yes, okay. Absolutely right. Emphasizing reclaiming, refurbishment, refurbishment and reuse of furniture, 73% on the mark. All right, final question, uh, third one. Extended producer responsibility means first choice, Shonda Rhimes signed a new five-year contract. Second, extended re producer responsibility means manufacturers assume responsibility for their post-consumer products. Third, extended producer responsibility is holding kids responsible for the messes they make. Fourth, holding parents responsible for the messes their kids make. Or fifth, extended producer responsibility means lifetime warranty on any furniture purchase. Submit your vote. Great. And in this case, there's actually 
Two right answers. The one that got 73%, same percentage as last time, manufacturers assume responsibility for their post-consumer products. And also, you could have selected lifetime warranty on any furniture purchase. All right, so we're, we are ready to roll here. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Hirshhorn. I'll introduce myself a little further later on. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Driving Sustainability and Furniture and Design. Join the change. So New York City has a vast sustainability and waste challenge. Furniture and design-related waste are huge contributors to that problem. This morning, We'll explore some new and creative initiatives and the revival of old-fashioned solutions aimed at redirecting and or vastly reducing furniture and interior design-related waste and simultaneously championing healthy, sustainable interiors. So just to explain, when we talk about furniture and design-related waste, you see it all around every day. Sofas left on the sidewalk. Dumpster is piled high with plywood used just once. Dumpster is piled high with desks and offices and office chairs in seemingly fine condition outside of an office renovation site. Massive amounts of debris, sheetrock, wood beams, pipes, toilets, sinks, all pouring out from building demolitions. This is what we mean by furniture and design related wastes. So today we're exploring four questions. What are current promising solutions right under our noses, what can each of us do today? Second, what are new or visionary solutions on the horizon? Where are the greatest opportunities? Third, in fact, is there an entirely new, fundamentally new way of looking at waste, furniture, and interiors? And fourth, what gives us hope and inspiration? This year marks New York City's third refashion week. Congratulations to our friends at the Sanitation Foundation and Donate NYC on the week. Today, we're proud that this year, this is the first ever redesign track within refashion week, extending the question of waste to looking not just at fashion, but also at furniture and design related waste. Both this day and the full week share a goal, the New, York, uh, New York City's goal, of sending zero waste to the landfill by 2030. And as we say in this slide, challenging New Yorkers to imagine a world in which all products, including furniture and furnishings, are made, consumed, shared, and remade sustainably. Quick reminder, we have three other design-related, uh, redesigned day events today. From 1 to 2 p.m., there's an inside the designer studio conversation. What can sustainable furniture, fashion, and food movements learn from each other? From four to five, there's a game show, totally participatory. Guess the origin, sustainability can be fun. And all throughout the day until five and through the week, there's a virtual marketplace. And at the end of today's session, we'll give you information and links so you could register for any of those you want. Finally, how will today's session go? Driving sustainability in furniture and design, it, it's a huge topic. We could do a, an entire week-long seminar on this. Today, we have just an hour. So we're going to focus on five illustrative slices of the solution pie. In the next hour, I'm going to spend a minute setting the context. We're going to hear from five leaders in the field. There'll be time for Q&A, and we'll offer you some follow-up resources. I encourage you throughout the session, if you have questions, to enter them into the question section. And if you have technical concerns or are having trouble with the functionality, this is called Livestorm, put those in the chat room and our colleague Ali will respond to you. But with questions for me or questions for panelists, put those in the questions. And if a question is specific to one presenter, Note that. All right. Quickly. Next slide. Fortunately, New York City has a lot of visionary leaders with inventive solutions to the problems we're addressing today. Today, we'll speak with four of them, 
and a bit with yours truly. First, uh, and all of these uh, today's speakers are directors of leaders of their own um, companies or organizations. Uh, Pantilla Pataparasit of Sabai, Justin Green of Big Reuse, Laurence Carr of Laurence Carr Incorporated, Julie Raskin of the Sanitation Foundation, and yours truly, Michael Hirshhorn of Mebel Transforming Furniture. All right, take a look at this video. <laughs> This year, our world will generate over 2.6 trillion pounds of trash. At this rate, this figure will reach 8 trillion pounds per year by the year 2100. The convenient economy of take, make, waste turns out not to be so convenient. Trash is a global problem. We are running out of places to put it, depleting our natural resources, and drowning in toxic waste. But there is good news. Smarter design is emerging that embodies the restorative principles of the circular economy. Artists, designers, craftspeople, and others with keen antennae, ingenuity, and a drive to make practical beauty view trash as a new class of abundant raw material with which they design and create useful objects full of imagination, purpose, and humor. Global influences from traditional wisdom to cutting-edge technology are forging new alchemies, transforming trash into objects of desire and agents of change. Listen to an object long enough and it will tell you what it wants to be next. Help us promote a shift in global thinking with our design stories from the circular economy. All right, I'll try that again. Julie, welcome to the stage. That was a global, that video offered a global look. Yep. Help us understand the scale and scope of the furniture and design related waste problem in New York City. Sure. Um, nice to meet you and thank you for having me. I'm Julie Raskin, the executive director of the Sanitation Foundation, which is the official nonprofit partner of New York City's Department of Sanitation. Um, so we see firsthand what gets thrown out in New York City. And uh, every four years, the Department of Sanitation conducts something called a waste characterization study in which we actually take samples of waste from around the city and have individual humans sort it into um, different um, materials. And we come up with, you know, facts and figures projecting out what goes into the waste. Um, so we do know, unfortunately, that New York City generates 950 tons of furniture and design related waste per year. Um, and just to put that in context, I, I don't want to um, diminish the importance of the rest of Refashion Week, but that's about double um, the amount of textile waste that ends up in the trash each year. So it's, it's a really big problem. And that's why I'm really happy that Mebel came on board this year to help us expand the scope of Refashion Week. Um, so just to sort of wrap your head around it, these, you know, tons are hard to imagine. Most of us don't <laughs> think in those terms on a daily basis. So uh, what does that equal? Drum roll. <laughs> 1,541 statues of liberty per year. Um, that is a lot of furniture waste. Uh, when you take that number and extrapolate to all of the United States, that's 12.1 million tons of furniture waste. Drum roll. <laughs> what does that equal for us in New York? 823 Brooklyn bridges worth of waste. Um, and important to note how much that number has risen since 1960. So as um, Michael stated, New York City has an ambitious goal to send zero waste to landfills by 2030. Um, part of the reason my organization exists is because the sanitation department recognized that government alone can't do that. It really takes cross-sector collaboration, um, partnerships, innovative leaders like the rest of my panelists here today. 
And um, it's going to take a lot of smart minds and, will and willpower to get this done. Julie, this mountainous problem, wh what gives you hope, inspiration? Um, you <laughs> and all of us here today, honestly. I mean, just seeing how um, we've been partnering with Donate NYC on Refashion Week over the last two years and just seeing the growth of this um, since it started three years ago, I think the awareness is finally catching up of what the problem is. And, you know, I have no doubt that business leaders, nonprofit leaders, government leaders can work together to figure something out. So I'm, I'm very inspired by my fellow panelists here today and excited to hear about their solutions. So <clears throat> you saw the slide, you, you heard in the video a reference to um, where they said the convenience economy of take, make, waste turns out to be not so convenient. This is the current model in place really since the Industrial Revolution of the old current linear economy. This is the way more or less we live today around the world from raw materials to things designed, to production, to distribution, to consumption, to waste. There's a huge movement. You heard about in the mention in the video where they said, but there's good news. Smarter design is emerging that embodies the restorative principles of the circular economy. Notice here, same ingredients starting at the top, raw material, such as minerals, trees, water, fossil fuels, to design, to pro producing, to distribution, to consumption, and the addition of an additional arrow, recycling. And notice that recycling points right back to raw materials. Obviously, this is a simplistic view of the circular economy designed for an hour-long uh, webinar. But this is the basic model we'll be talking about today. Now, for many, the key principles of the circular economy framework, which seeks to replace the linear economy norms. Here's four of those key principles. First, fundamentally, the Earth has a finite set of resources, and our current rate of depletion is wildly unsustainable. Second principle of the circular economy, reducing use of new resources and emphasizing reuse of materials. Third, designing products from the start, from the very way they're designed, so that they last longer, so that instead of being meant for replacement, they're meant for endurance. And fourth, that those who make things take responsibility for next life usage. What happens, they take responsibility for what happens to a product after its initial consumer use. So each of our presenters this morning illustrates a different phase of the circular economy cycle that you're looking at, while they're also simultaneously tied to almost every other phase. So for example, Sabai. Sabai makes sustainable furniture with recycled and natural materials. You'll hear a lot more about it when Pantilla talks. Notice Sabai is lodged, emphasizing the design and production phase, but also connected to the recycling and consumption phase. Next, Big Reuse. Big Reuse operates a reuse center with everything from furniture to appliance and much more. And notice they're lodged at the recycling and distribution side and connected to many other facets. Laurence Carr is an interior design firm committed to nurturing health and wellness. Connected to almost every facet of the cycle, consumption, raw materials, which raw materials go into your sofa, your carpet, design, and the Sanitation Foundation. Naturally, Julie said they're the nonprofit partner of the New York City Department of Sanitation. So they're very involved at the cons consumption, recycling, and back into raw material end. And finally, 
uh, where I work, Mebel Transforming Furniture. We're all about championing furniture built of reclaimed wood, plastic, and metal. So notice, interestingly, that what we do is create new, hopefully beautiful, and feature furniture that's made from waste. Other speakers today will be talking about what happens to furniture when it becomes waste. Different phases of the cycle. So, Pantilla, can you tell us about Sabai? Uh, yes, definitely. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everyone. My name is Pantel, and I'm one of the co-founders of Sabai Design. Our mission is to make sustainable living acceptable. We first do this through trying to make our products as comprehensively sustainable as possible. This goes to the materials, the manufacturing process, packaging, design, and also, most recently, end-of-life cycle solutions. At the same time, we also know that sustainable furniture um, is often a lot of out of a lot of people's budgets. So we've designed our products to try to make them as affordable as possible. We launched in 2019 with our first line of products, our essential seating collection, which includes sofas, sectionals, and ottomans. And we partner with a family-owned factory in North Carolina to produce our pieces ethically and locally. Uh, Danya, if you go to the next slide. So in terms of solutions that I think that people can um, practically do now, I think first of all is with respect to materials. So I would really encourage customers to do a lot of digging into what um, goes into their furnitures and what companies are using. And to dig a little deeper when one company says, you know, they use one specific material or they plant a tree when they, uh, when you buy something to really understand what they're actually doing and get a more uh, holistic picture. Uh, Danya could go to the next slide. In addition to that, as Michael referenced, to try to really reduce the amount of waste that the furniture industry produces. Um, we recently, for example, launched an initiative to encourage customers to repair their furniture if, for example, a leg gets chewed up or something like that, rather than replacing a whole piece or throwing away a whole piece. Um, I think that that type of mindset could really have a huge impact and reduce the amount of waste that we generate. Um, in addition to these two things, um, just generally, I like to buy a lot of vintage furniture. Um, I know that that's something that's really grown a lot in New York recently. So I think that's a fun way to um, really try to reduce the impact when it comes to furniture. Um, at the same time, as Michael referenced, in New York, obviously, you see a lot of furniture on the curb all the time. So I'd really encourage people, if you're moving or trying to sell things, to put a little bit more thought into it prior to kind of plan so that things don't end up on the curb like that. Um, Danya, you can go ahead. In terms of new things that we're looking at, um, I referenced this briefly earlier, but we recently launched what we're calling the Spy Standard, which includes two initiatives. First, our Repair Don't Replace program, and secondly, our Spy Revive program, which is our closed loop program where if one of our customers ever wants to, you know, if they're moving or anything like that and want to get rid of their sofa, We'll actually take it back, we'll handle that whole process and resell them as secondhand products and give those customers a commission on those sales to really try to um, make sure that our products never end up in a landfill. Um, however, in addition to that, one thing that we're really interested in is materials. Um, as part of our goal of making our furniture as sustainable as possible, we're constantly reaching out to new innovators in that field to see what different materials we can incorporate and improve upon. Um, and so that's something that we've definitely seen a lot of um, exciting things around and something that looking ahead, I think we'd be excited to get involved in. And that's it. <laughs> um, Pantella, tell us a little bit about the whole world of greater sustainability when sofas don't arrive in huge crates or gigantic boxes. Yeah, well, um, with respect to our products, our products are flat packed. So I think that speaks to both the convenience that a lot of consumers kind of want nowadays, but at the same time, um, because it's designed in a way that is um, assembled and comes in pieces, that also lends itself a lot to um, repairing rather than having to, you know, throw away an entire piece or reupholster an entire piece. Um, and so part of our repair don't replace program, you can, you know, place an arm if that gets damaged, a front rail, cushions, anything like that. Um, and so 
that's kind of how we've approached things in terms of making sure that our products um, are convenient, but durable and um, lessen their impact. The another question on that, and the 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 whole ability to disassemble as well as assemble something. Mm -hmm. Explain how that uh, is leads to sustainability. Yeah. So with disassembly, um, it leads in, leads into sustainability in terms of you know repairing pieces and things like that, but also making sure that you can easily um, take it with you um, so that you don't have to get rid of it. Um, and so the pieces disassemble just as easily as they are assembled. And so you can always take them with you and even fit them in like in a car if you're moving or something like that. Are you focused, is Sabai focused on a particular demographic? Yeah, I would say that um, because our goal is to make sustainable living accessible, we're definitely focused on a demographic that is somewhat on a budget. Obviously it's still a little bit pricey um, because of all the things that go into it, but we're definitely focused on a demographic that is um, usually between like 25 to 35, but obviously any age range, um, but that's usually the demographic that we see. But in terms of geographically, it's really all over all over the country. <clears throat> and I was uh, sharing with Pantilla the story of uh, my just out of college nephew came to live with us for a year. And when he moved in, purchased an inexpensive sofa a year later, he got accepted to grad school and was moving out and said, hey, uncle, do you want this sofa, which I didn't really need? He said, because if you don't, I'm just going to leave it on the curb. And that was such a window into exactly the one of hundreds of points of the change from a linear to a circular economy. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Scott, you have, there's a question for you from uh, Scott Jordan. What are the upholstery materials used in your furniture? Yeah, so in terms of like the fabric and things like that, we use a few different fabrics. We use um, one of the fabrics is an upcycled fabric. Um, and so that um, obviously is used, typically a waste product and doesn't use any land or water in its production. And the other fabric is a velvet fabric that's made out of um, recycled water bottles. We're also looking into adding a few other fabrics. One is a natural fiber fabric, one is um, a bio-based leather. I know that when it comes to textiles and just materials generally, people associate different, or people value different things when it comes to sustainability. So we want to make sure that we're offering those different things. Some people care about things being natural fiber um, because they might not, um, might be allergic or not do well with synthetics, um, even though sometimes synthetics are, some synthetics are um, very sustainable and don't require, you know, treatments or anything like that. So we try to offer a few different options when it comes to our fabrics. And uh, last question in my barrage. What, Pantella, what keeps this from going really big? Um, I think that we're just trying to grow thoughtfully. And so, um, you know, making sure that we can still maintain the standards that we want to maintain um, as we grow. And so it's more just our own pace and wanting to make sure that we stay true to our values as we grow. Um, we're looking at adding additional products right now, but it does take time to you know source the right suppliers and come with the right design to make sure that um, it aligns with everything that we're trying to do. Um, so I think it just comes from, in terms of like any inhibitors, it's just a lot of considerations. And then just manpower, we're a small team right now. Um, so just trying to do everything that we can. Okay, I, I'm breaking my promise because I've got two more questions for you. I'm gonna <laughs> pack them together. Um, the question was also, can you tell us about the cushioning materials used and are the toxicity levels in the materials, adhesives, et cetera, used in your, um, oh, used, this may or may not be for, for you, used in your furniture or the process of production low? Do you use certified textiles like GOT or GOT? Yes. So in terms of the cushions, we use certi pure certified cushions. And so one thing that I forgot to mention earlier or kind of referenced earlier in terms of things that you can do, I would say that, you know, part of the process of questioning brands and manufacturers about products 
um, like as a brand, we learn a lot from that. And so when customers really pressure us and ask us a lot of these questions, it becomes more and more of a focus. It already was, but you know, it just puts more pressure on us. So I'd encourage people to do that more. But in terms of our products, um, that was the cushions. In terms of the fabrics, our um, vel recycled velvet fabric is GOTS certified, also OECO Tech certified. Our upcycled fabric is Green Guard Gold certified. Um, and we really have put a huge emphasis on making sure that our product is non-toxic. We used to use a water-based glue for our upholstery and recently switched, or last year switched to um, just using mechanical fasteners to make uh, to limit the amount of glue that goes into our products um, or to not use glue in our products and to make sure that um, with mechanical fasteners you can actually separate those materials and recycle them whereas with glue you can't. Um, so that's what we've done. Thanks a million. We'll be back to you. And now we're going to shift to a video. Uh, we found this online. It is as sad as it may be funny, but it really, it's a video that epitomizes the change we're looking for. This is the linear economy side of it. And then our next speaker, Justin, will be circular economy solutions to the exact same issue. Um, run the video. So uh, <clears throat> there you go, Justin. Justin is the founder and executive director of Big Reuse, and we're opening with a slide which shows a far better way for the next stage life of a sofa. You're on, Justin. Thanks, Sid. Thanks for having us. Or having me and Big Reuse, all, all the, the uh, speakers. It's great to have the focus for Refashion Week be a, a wider and include furniture. It's a big part of what we do at Big Reuse. We're a nonprofit organization um, that's focused on the environment, uh, reducing waste, fighting climate change. We do that through a couple of different programs uh, currently. One is our Reuse Center in Brooklyn, where we take in, we're, we're unlike most other thrift stores, is we sort of take in anything we think is reusable. So it could be, we take in building materials, doors, windows, plumbing fixtures, um, kitchen cabinets, furniture. We're taking a lot of furniture. We have about a 20,000 square foot space. We take in clothes, home goods, um, books, basically anything. So we, we're sort of like a super store for reusable items. Um, we've been doing this for uh, many years. That's our team from our team processing, Debrina and Willis and Tanasia uh, processing stuff. So we get there's just so much waste and we see just like the endless streams of reusable materials um, available in New York City that otherwise would go to landfills. Justin, uh, could you just say a little more, what do you mean by processing? What exactly are, the, are they, well, your colleagues doing? I mean, it's literally just like unpacking it from boxes, you know, getting rid of the broken stuff and, and pricing it. You know, we're, as a nonprofit, um, we're self-supporting our effort to take in all this different material that isn't really taken in by a lot of other thrift stores, um, is just supported by our, our resale and, and our expensive rent, the rent is market rate. So this is not funded by um, the city, it's just a, a regular thrift store, but, but we try, we're a focus on waste reduction um, versus like sort of maximizing our profits. Um, and then we also operate, and this is not part of those pictures, but we operate uh, two community composting sites um, in the city in Brooklyn and Queens and 30 food scrap drop-offs. So when the city canceled um, uh, curbside compost collection, uh, we became one of the main places to compost and we compost around a thousand tons of material and give that away to parks and community gardens. Um, at our reuse center, uh, we divert about a million pounds of reusable material um, every year and you know we're part of of a solution anyone can participate in and it's you know donating your materials not throwing it out um 
trying to plan for uh, end of life before you move, like putting that in the top of the list. Um, and it's important. I mean, not only, but it's difficult in New York City because New York City is expensive and the rent is really expensive and storage is really expensive. So a lot of thrift stores don't take that much furniture. Um, they are home goods or, or, and we're really one of the only places that takes building materials. So, and building materials are about 50% of the waste stream in the city, uh, 40 to 50%. So it's, it, there's such a potential for reuse, but there are a lot of market limitations because, um, you know, thrift stores focus on clothes, um, because it's a lot, uh, you can, have a lot more clothes packed into uh, a square foot than, a, than one sofa. So they tend to focus on that. And that's just one of the limits. But reuse is also important in a number of different ways and not only environmentally, but um, in sort of a local economy fashion. So there's a, a, it, it hits and, and has a community benefit in a number of different ways. One is creating jobs, right? We have created about 15 jobs here. Um, we work with job training programs. Um, and that's just from this million pounds that otherwise would have been thrown out. And this could be multiplied across every neighborhood um, in terms of a, a sort of self-sustaining uh, programs that create jobs and keep material out of landfill. Um, and that, you know, the other important thing to think about in terms of waste is waste equity. Um, you know, our material, where does our material go? I mean, it has a big environmental impact, but the landfills, are in West Virginia where we send a lot of our materials. A lot of our materials are incinerated in Newark, um, creating pollution in Newark. So the, you know, when we throw things out, um, it, we have to think about where it's going and what communities they're actually affecting at the end. Um, so our solution that you know, I'm hoping for is more uh, government support uh, for reuse and being able to create um, create um, uh, sort of reuse centers that can process materials. There's some examples of this in Europe um, where they are become job training centers and reuse centers. Here's, you know, a, a, um, a trading desk from like, like some trading, uh, uh, trading firm. So we get everything um, from, from people doing renovations to movie sets to businesses uh, moving or closing down to people just getting rid of, uh, you know, some clothes that they don't want. Um, I think on terms of producer responsibility, uh, solutions we'd like to see is, is, is really more aggressive producer responsibility. And I think we've touched on that already, but the state is considering um, some legislation on that right now at the assembly. Um, and that would be, I think, really important because it can't always be on the consumer to figure out the solution, right? We need broader systems either you know funded by government or legislated so that when you want to recycle uh your uh you know particle board thing you got from ikea that there's actually a place for it to go because right now there's no place for it to go if it's broken it goes in the garbage but there are technologies to recycle um you know uh, manufactured wood products they're just not available here they need that sort of support and structural investment so, Justin, uh, I noticed on your website that the the um, function you're involved in is a reuse center, but your vision and mission as a nonprofit is far broader. Talk about that for a minute. Yeah, I mean, our as a, a non, as someone said it within the chat, they're having he trouble hearing me speak, but I'm I'm at I'm at work. <laughs> Our stores open to the public and staff, so I'm keeping the mask on, but I'll take it off for now. Um, what, uh, you know, I think we're trying to establish sort of different models of, of, we stepped into this first because building materials, there's so many reusable building materials out there that get thrown away and there was no place for them to go. So that's how we got started. And then we kept seeing all this other material that wasn't really finding a home. So we kept adding stuff so now we take in everything. So it just sort of kept expanding. And I think, you know, it we're a model for a solution that could be spread across the city, across the state. Um, just is there's so much value in that material. You know, we take that a thousand a million pounds of material that gets thrown out and we generate jobs, we generate revenue. Um, it's challenging, but it's it's a, a, 
a model to create a local economy, local solutions, um, and uh, and environmental fashion. Um, and the other part is fighting climate change. So it's you know the funds that we generate here when we do uh, manage to generate a profit go back into new programs. That's how we have a composting program. For we were able to launch that a couple of years ago, and now compost like I said a thousand times annually. Right. Hey, Justin, you got a question here. One of the biggest barriers for the buyers of used wares is all of the different vendors. I'm excited by businesses like Cherish and First Dibs. What are your thoughts on the role of aggregators like these firms? You know, I think it, it, there's so much waste. I think it's all a good solution. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges from some of these um, platforms is they sort of cherry pick. So they, you know, they divert about 25% of the stuff that's out, uh, that they get listed. And a lot of, like I've heard, I've talked to a few of those um, local places that, that buy and sell locally, and they only move about 25%, 75% so it gets tossed. Cherish and First Dibs are different. They're just the fancy stuff. But it's all, you know, I think that's all useful. I think it's all part of, of trying to create a solution. You game for one more question? Yeah, I can keep uh, talking for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm digging in here. Why on earth did you get into this field, Justin? Why did you found this company, this this nonprofit? You know, I think it's really, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure all of us that are doing this are compelled by just seeing waste and being like totally disturbed by the useful stuff we see in, in um, dumpsters, you know. My grandmother, kept, you know, survived the Great Depression and kept every single scrap of everything and never threw out stuff. And I think just seeing that um, sort of inspired me and just not wanting to waste stuff. I mean, I think being an environmentalist, you move into that and you see uh, perfectly good furniture in the garbage or wood in the garbage. And it's just very frustrating. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll be back to you, Justin. Um, Laurence, uh, tell us about Healthy Interiors and much more. Yes, Michael, thank you for having me. Um, so just introducing briefly my boutique firm, Laurence Carr Incorporated, which is an interior design studio specializing in crafting residential and hospitality environments. And we truly emphasize sustainability, health and wellness. I'm a passionate advocate um, for sustainability and circular economy. And as such, I'm a proud ambassador for the Sustainable Furnishing Council and a member of the International Future Living uh, Institute. So we launched our company in 2008 and since then strive to advocate for healthy materials, wellness interiors with peace of mind, knowing that each environment crafted for our clients in mindful, is mindfully composed with responsible sourcing, limiting waste and focus on reuse and upcycling. Um, so in terms of solution, I'll start with um, source, really sourcing responsibly, um, eco-friendly, sustainable furniture. So there are great industry certifications that have been mentioned before, you know, and they, these certifications allow to identify whether materials have been responsibly sourced and whether the manufacturer has adopted sustainable processes that limit waste. Transparency. Um, the consumer demand for transparency is key. Um, and so to do so, you know, I encourage, um, you know, everyone to ask questions, understand the life cycle assessment process of each product um, that is uh, planned to be purchased. Um, you know, taking a little extra time to find out where and how these products are made, produced, manufactured, what they are made for, uh, of and where how those materials were sourced becoming familiar with terms like ethically made local communities local sources artisan makers vintage which used to be uh, called antics we still call them antics in europe or overseas retake furniture program you know like um, ikea and sabai and other upcoming um, contenders and programs in furnishings, organizations like the Sustainable Furnishing Council, Forest Stewardship Council, GOTS, um, and OECOTEXT make it easy to identify ethical, sustainable sources for your need. 
Another thing is that we encourage our clients to reuse, 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 upholster versus replacing. Because too often interior design projects, either for new construction or renovations, reflexively replaced old furniture, which all too often ends up in landfill. With a little creativity, renewing or upholstering old furniture can be the answer. If replacement is necessary, another idea is to replace with antiques, um, which dram dramatically, oh, again, you know, help reducing waste. I will also say that kitchen is a central room at home where everyone gathers, eats, socializes, even works works and play, really, really designing for composting, you know, and really encouraging our clients to compost food scraps and eating leftovers, you know, contact your city to inquire about the compost program, get a countertop composter and a worm bean. And if you have pace on your property, start a corner compost in the ground. Um, can we change to the second uh, slide, please? Um, so to conclude, I'd say I really feel that if we people commit to changing our relation to creation and waste and shift our focus to regenerative design and a circular economy, we can reverse years of damage and prevent long term environmental disaster. So that's why I believe in the importance and power of regenerative design and the role it can play in helping the earth recover from past damage with improving the wellness of the people living on this planet. So my calling is not just about crafting beautiful and functional spaces, but also closely intertwined with responsible mindful solutions that, be, that benefit everyone involved. So again, the best long-term solution to conclude is that um, it will have a maximum benefit to the most people and industry is to moving forward circular design and a circular economy. In a more circular model, as you explained, Michael, we have the potential to reduce the negative impact on the environment, improve positive impact, and contribute to a stronger economy, all while creating modern and memorable spaces, buildings, homes, hospitality spaces, commercial space, furniture, and decor. So, Laurence, I'm so curious. A, a, a quote, typical client comes to you. Uh, they want to renovate a living space or they're building a new office are they coming to you because they're interested in what you specialize in or are they coming to you and you have to start at step one and explain let's talk about sustainability let's talk about circular economy or is it a, how does that work they come to us because they know that the service and the niche and the specialty we offer um, they truly are tend to know what they want. They're conscious consumers. Uh, they have done uh, their, um, you know, uh, diligence work, or they truly have uh, uh, um, their uh, focus on really uh, purchasing while you know being mindful of what they want and renovating or you know doing a, a new construction with um, that in mind. So and that's the process for what we for what we, we offer. Was it, can you recall a time when a, a client was further out there than you? Um, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, but you know what? I do hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two, two more questions. Um, can you, uh, some of us are not familiar with the term regenerative. Can you give an example of what that means? And um, you, you referred to, I think, a couple of websites about um, ethical, sustainable sources. Could you state them more slowly? Oh, um, it's what I, I was mentioning is the terms, is that, you know, for the consumer to really uh, uh, want to hear that from their manufacturers, because it all starts with the consumer demand. So I was suggesting just to become familiar with these terms. Um, in terms of, um, I'm sorry, what was your first question to, to explain? Regenerative. Oh, regenerative. So, uh, you know, I often compare to uh, food, you know, as I mentioned with composting, um, you know, what, what, you know, we take out of the, the, the soil, we eat, we con you know, we cook, we consume, and then we have to know how to put back. So the concept is the same. It's the circular economy model that you explained, you know, understanding the life cycle assessment, where it's sold from the raw material to where, how it's been made, to then how it's been uh, consumed and, and used by the consumer to how, you know, the take back program is and what happens to that furniture once we decide we don't, 
you know, uh, use it anymore. Um, and then, and then, you know, so we can upcycle it. So it's 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 that concept of circle economy, circular design, that it, it does not end up in the landfill. That's what regenerative design is. In comparison to, uh, same, very parallel to the, f the fashion, you know, movement, um, as well as the food movement. Great, okay. So listen, I have one question for you, and then we're gonna, we're going to um, move on to uh, back to Julie. Yes. Um, uh, Laurence, the question says, the ephemeral nature of style and trends seems antithetical to sustainability. The labeling of items as, quote, ugly speeds the velocity of waste. How do you grapple with that industry-wide challenge? I'd say, uh, you know, for, uh, the demand starts from consumers. It's really about... Um, knowing what you like, who you are, what surrounds yourself. We design for wellness, we design for well-being, we truly support, you know, clients and consumers to learn about surrounding themselves with things that matter. Um, you know, do not follow trends, do not follow, just follow your heart. You know, have a heart-centered, uh, make heart-centered decisions. What is important to yourself? You know, is it the future of your planet? How to save it? How for us to have more longevity and our the future generations? And from that questions, you know, then make decisions on what you buy from food to fashion to furniture to your interiors. Every single decision counts. That's my answer. And... Uh Julie, uh, to me, a light bulb goes off for a future, for a next year. Uh, I imagine this question is as pertinent to fashion as it is to furniture, this whole question of style and trends and the relationship to waste. Maybe we can combine those conversations um, in the future. Justin, quick question for you. Uh, Nancy asks, can you partner with 1-800-GOT-JUNK and take their junk for recycling? Yeah, we... Um We've tried, we've partnered with a few other um, uh, groups. Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. I mean, it's not required of them to try to recycle or reuse, you know, so they come when convenient. Yeah, I know it's part of their branding that they do that, and that's an interesting insider look. So let's go to, uh, back to Julie. Uh, Julie explained before the scope of the waste problem in New York. Here, we're looking to Julie for on the solution side. Um, okay. I'll, I'll be so brief because I want to leave some time for, for more Q&A. Um, but just what you see here is something that the foundation runs called the Treasures in the Trash Collection. So this is part of our work, a uh, large part of our work is public engagement and getting people to recognize the problem of waste. So we have a um, retired sanitation worker, Nelson Molina, who for 30 years on his route in Harlem was um, picking up objects that were thrown out in the trash that he thought were not garbage and refurbishing them and storing them away in his garage in East Harlem. So now he has over 40,000 items there. Um, next slide, please. A lot of it is um, salvaged furniture and really in really great shape. So um, just to draw attention to that. Next slide. But I think what, what I really want to highlight, my co-host for Refashion Week is a program in sanitation called Donate NYC. And I think this is um, unfortunately the best kept secret in New York. I wish everybody knew about it, but it's an app and a website um, that any resident can go to if you have stuff to give away and find out the closest places to you. You know, Justin is one of the founding partners, Big Reuse, um, his shop is on there, but also Goodwill, um, housing works, et cetera. And so, you know, the origin of Refashion Week was to drive um, traffic and awareness to this website. And unfortunately, we're limited in, in the government budget on um, marketing dollars. So we do what we can through word of mouth and partnerships. Um, next slide. And I think just looking ahead and sort of thinking a little bit bigger picture and more visionary, um, this is an example of something IKEA is doing to make their furniture more recyclable. But I think you know the real um, shift is gonna come when we really engage furniture makers um, the same way that we're trying to do with the Extended Producer Responsibility Act um, for consumer packaged goods 
and sort of put the onus on the production um, to help fund and solve for the end of life use of those objects. So, you know, Justin said he wishes there was more government funding. I wish so too. Um, you know, we, we can do a lot. We've done that with electronics where the electronics makers um, kind of all pay into a fund that we use to fund some nonprofits um, in our network that do electronics recycling. So, um, you know, I would also like to see sort of what Justin's done uh, on, a, on a municipal scale. And I think it's gonna take um, cross-sector collaboration, as I said, and significant funding and designing products with end of life in mind. In an earlier conversation, Julie, you talked to me about the role of the upcoming um, museum in getting at the fundamental awareness and acknowledgement on the part of people about what is waste and trash. Can you talk about that? Sure. So the um, what you saw with um, Nelson Molina's collection, some people call it the trash museum, but it's it's really not a museum. It's a collection. We are actually though planning. Um, we've just started a strategic planning process to really build a um, official New York City uh, museum of sanitation. So this is you know similar to the transit museum um, or the police and fire museum, meant to really engage New Yorkers. I think our, our target audience is probably middle schoolers first and foremost. That's really an age where you start to kind of wrap your brain around this, but um, really get people young understanding the problem, but also already starting to think about and see what solutions might be. All right, so let's go to, um, thanks, Julie. Uh, I'm gonna, let's switch over, Dinah, to, to Mebel. So I have a second hat here. I'm moderating the panel. I'm also one of the panelists. Uh, we have a company called Mebel Transforming Furniture. Our particular focus is the world of furniture that's made from reuse or reclaiming metal, wood, and plastic. And what we're trying to do is say, this furniture can be beautiful, high quality, versatile, and replace a lot of what's currently made from virgin or new materials. This is a snapshot of our uh, screenshot of our Instagram page. And we're exactly trying to get at the idea that all of reclaimed furniture is not just cool barn board tables in hip coffee shops, that it's made from, if you look at the top middle, those are oil cans. If you look at the uh, middle row on the left, those are old skateboards. If you look at the bottom right, those chairs are made from defective eyeglasses, uh, lunchroom trays, and other discarded plastics. If you look at the middle row on the right, that gorgeous dining room table is made from discarded wine barrels. So it's all about trying to build consumer and producer perception that what's made in the world of furniture from reuse of materials, especially metal, wood, and plastic, can be far vaster, broader and move from a niche to the mainstream of the marketplace. Uh, next slide. So we show this here, take a look, five chairs. On the left, these range from the fanciful and the grandiose to the everyday and more traditional. On the left, the rather lordly uh, uh, orange chair, it, that's made from oil barrels, sanitized, cleaned in Burkina Faso, uh, West Africa. In the middle, these are the, the chairs I just referred to. These are uh, made in upstate New York from uh, the default defective eyeglasses and other plastics, handcrafted. And on the right, wooden chairs made of barn boards in a rather traditional uh, farm style. Price points here range from uh, a couple of hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars. So it's trying to get at the idea that a lot of materials, a lot of designs, a lot of price points, that there's a world of furniture that could be created without sacrificing good design, without sacrificing aesthetics, without sacrificing quality that could be made from reclaimed materials. Um, next slide. A vision we, we have, one degree, is it's been so inspiring that mainstream companies like Room and Board on the left, and a Polish company, Numa, on the right, these companies are now looking to 
furniture, these are large mainstream furniture retailers, and they are trying to insert pieces made from reclaimed materials right into the mainstream of their collection. In other words, not sidelined as, oh, and look at the reclaimed pieces, but rather when you click on cabinets, this is one of the options that comes up for room and board. You know, when you when you click up, click on living room, this is one of the options that comes up for mode media furniture, that we'd like to see this, uh, the, the shift in supply streams for the mass production of furniture shift from a reliance at this time, 99.8%, almost entirely on new materials to a gr far greater percentage uh, on reuse and reclaimed materials. All right, we have, um, let's see, move on, Danya. And I have a question here um, for everybody. So someone can grab this. Uh, to any and all panelists, what role, if any, have strategic partnerships played in furthering your commitment to sustainability and the circular economy? Do you have advice for fostering such partnerships? Who wants to grab that? Well, we, I mean, as a nonprofit, we're a hundred percent dependent on partnerships. So, you know, like uh, Julie talked about, we, we have a, depart a partnerships with Department of Sanitation on many levels. So not only on Donate NYC, which is great, but, um, also with the, our composting program is, is a partnership. We're on city parks land. Um, the uh, Department of Sanitation is, we work really closely with them on our composting. And so they um, are the funder for that and our, our collaborator on composting. But we have 200 community partners who take the compost after we produce it. So it's as a nonprofit, you're a hundred percent dependent on partnerships um, in the community and with other groups. Uh, and I think in terms of increasing impact, you know, I think all of us working together to push, uh, you know, the city or the state towards uh, legislation that encourages greener practices is, is key to the next step. So that's like, all of us working together. So that's another, you know, sort of partnerships um, step. Oops, you're muted, Michael. Um, would, any, would any others like to speak about partnerships? Do you have a key partner you work with? What's been successful in making that uh, an effective partnership? Uh, yeah, I can say some things. Um, I think even, I think for us, partnerships have really been crucial as well, um, specifically with respect to our um, Survive Revive program. You know, in order to do that type of buyback program as a smaller business, um, it really requires a lot of, um, it's a huge operation, basically. And so for us to actually be, to be able to launch that program, we partnered with a company that Kind of localizes those types of buybacks and resales um, so not everything has to be shipped all the way back to the location you know across the country sometimes and things like that so um, that was really crucial for us to actually be um, be able to launch that program so I think in terms like Justin said in terms of actually being able to make an impact um, partnerships are really crucial so Pantilla, you got me thinking about something actually mm -hmm. uh, let's say I buy one of your sofas and I'm in uh, California. You ship it to me, and six years later, I, I move or I don't. I don't mm -hmm. want it anymore. Uh, do I ship it back to no, you on the East Coast? There's a no, West Coast. No. Um, there's a West Coast hub, so there are different hubs all around um, the U.S. Um, with warehouses where those products are picked up and taken to, and you know, inspected, and if they need any repairs or anything like that, to kind of get it back. Um, those are done there and resold um, to the local area. All right, this is a great time. Anyone who's uh, joined us, a great time to pose questions uh, for anyone. Um, so Christina asks, uh, IKEA has launched a take back program. Is that right? Can someone grab that? I, I don't know, what, do you guys know about the IKEA program? I mean, the issue, I Go ahead. 
I was just gonna say, yeah. I think that they launched it in specific, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but in like Japan or New Zealand or something like that in specific countries where they're kind of testing it out right now. I'm not sure if it's reached the US yet. And, and the key there too is, is, you know, how they're doing it. You know, they can send disassembly instructions, but is there a way for them to actually recycle that particle board? You know, I think because particle board it ha needs that infrastructure um, to make it into more particle board and it's not really a, a process available in the US right now. Um, so, you know, all of their stuff is not only, it's not built, you mentioned, Michael, at the beginning, like lifetime warranty for material. Their stuff is not built to last a lifetime. So that's an issue right there. But then like how they're building it is I'd like to see that. I mean, if they decided to be more sustainable, that would be huge. So that would be, you know, if they were going to take back everything they made and made it into more stuff, that would be sort of an ideal solution. <clears throat> okay. To Christina and anyone else interested in this question, about IKEA or the broader question of take back programs. We are participating upcoming next, later this month is Circular City Week, New York. We'll email the information to everybody who's registered for this session. One of the panels we're honored to be part of and one of the guests is the Global Director of Sustainability and Circularity for IKEA. And that this will be a great question uh, for her to address. Uh, including what what about rollout in the United States, which I've also heard is um, lags behind other countries. So, um, Justin, thanks for sharing the composting information. I've stopped composting since New York City Sanitation stopped picking it up curbside. I will check out your website and see how I can connect. Thanks again. And... Um, For me, uh, let's see, I'm reading this in real time. I'm very interested in Mebel. I found out about this sustainability events via the link. Uh, I see that you promote all different kinds of artisans, but I don't see any prices on your website or your Instagram page. Is there a reason prices aren't mentioned? Great question. So, uh, Delan, so this year, as a result of the pandemic and uh, our need to pivot and close a, a storefront we have, we have now become not a furniture retailer, but a, a, a company with a social mission to promote the field of furniture made from reuse of materials. And our primary activities, a lot of them are just like this, knowledge, information, educational activities. So while we no longer sell anything, every time we list things, we tell you exactly who's making them and who's selling them. And those are the links um, on Instagram, those are links that are available via via the website. So, uh, and the, the the prices are often mentioned, of course, on the on the producers' Instagram pages or um, or websites. Um, Catherine says, "I found that being a designer who works with sustainable furnishings requires a slightly different business model. It takes different knowledge, sources, marketing, and planning. It would be great to learn from others." Um, anyone want to jump on that? Laurence? Yes, there are many ways to um, educate yourself. There are so many resources these days um, to just, just learn uh, from organizations such as the International Institute of Well Building. Um, you know, getting some uh, knowledge, uh, certification, uh, so the well, you know, a certification. It could be another one, the lead that's been here for ever um, the sustainable furnishing council you know becoming green leaders um, accredited professional the um, the healthy material labs at the new school learning all about transparency for um, material Uh, John Sarah Roof is going to be talking about this. Um, so it's it, there, are, there are so many ways to learn. I think we have a temporarily frozen Laurence. 
Let's give it a second. <clears throat> so, um, can you, Danya, can you shift to the next slide? So while, while we're waiting for Laurence, she happened to just mention the Parsons uh, Donya Healthier Materials Library. Uh, for those of you who are interested in a deeper dive, you know, into understanding, we use the paradigm of circularity earlier. Here is yet another paradigm you might want to look into, available at healthymaterials.org. And notice in this paradigm, it gets all the more multifaceted in which circularity is but one of six segments of categories of impact around furniture and furnishings. And this will be uh, at the very end, which sadly is just four minutes away, we'll be sharing a resource list with you and this will be one of the links that will be um, in that list. Laurence, are you back? Yes, can you see me? Can you yes, hear me? Yes, very well. You wanna finish, quickly yes. finish your comments? Oh, no, I was just saying, I, I, I'm not sure when I was cut off, but I understand that at least, you know, he went through the Parsons Material Labs. Uh, I was just uh, answering to this designer and just saying there are many ways for the, also the American Society of Interior Designers has a whole lot of wonderful, wonderful information on health, wellness, and sustainability. They're just starting a whole program. So that's one more resource to check. Yet another resource, which will be on the list, is the Sustainable Furnishings Council. We, we have found them incredibly uh, knowledgeable and helpful at every turn in our company's development. Uh, let me reflect with just a few minutes left on some of the things that, that we've heard today. I'm just going to echo comments made. I would really encourage customers to dig deep into what furniture companies are really doing and what furniture is really made of. We're constantly reaching out to innovators in the field of new materials. This is all part of a repair, replace, circular new system in which you can replace a leg or a cushion without having to throw out the whole piece of furniture. We sell about a million pounds of reusable materials a year, a million pounds. A lot of thrift stores, by contrast, don't take that much furniture, often because of space considerations. There are currently a lot of market limitations to reuse centers. And I see there's a question here about expanding big reuse to a location in every borough, um, which we I would encourage you to reach out to uh, Justin directly. We create a lot of jobs Consider waste equity. Consider that many of our things go to landfills in West Virginia. Others are incinerated in Newark. Look at the need for more government support for reuse centers. We operate as a small nonprofit. I'm, passion I'm a passionate advocate for circularity and sustainability. I strive for wellness interiors and emphasize peace of mind. Take the extra time to find out where and how things are made. Look at questions like ethical, are they ethically made? Are they artisan sourced? Are they vintage? Is there a retake furniture program? We need to change our relationship to creation and waste. My calling is mindful solutions. And we have to know how and when to put things back. And I'd like to highlight Donate NYC as an app, where to go when you have stuff to give away, check out the app. This has been an incredibly fruitful and of course way too brief discussion Again, an encouragement for Redesign Day, there are three other things you can take part in today. From one to two, there is a panel on uh, really an in the designer studio discussion among four women leaders in sustainable fashion, food and furniture movements, exploring what they can learn from each other. 
from four to five today. Have some fun. We have a game show, all interactive. Great time to bring your kids or kids at heart. Uh, that's called Guess the Origin. And there's a marketplace, which is open through Friday, where there's sustainable fashion and sustainable furniture products uh, accessible for sale at booths in a virtual marketplace. Uh, to register for these events, check out uh, the links that are in the uh, chat room, I believe. And once again, really thank you so much to the Sanitation Foundation, to Donate NYC for making this possible, to the New York Adventure Club for tech support, uh, to Pantilla from Sabai, Justin from Big Reuse, Laurence from Lawrence Car Incorporated, from Julie from the Sanitation Foundation, our guest presenters, and I want to say a personal note of thanks to the amazing Danya Rubenstein Markowitz, who is the behind the scenes mastermind who joined our company just a few weeks ago. And without her, we would um, be stumbling in the dark around getting the right slides up and the right, the right people to show up on the screen at the right time. Thank you. Thank you, Danya. Um, we uh, feel free to reach out to us. We are at info at Furniture dot com info at mobilefurniture dot com any questions that you have for any of the particular uh, presenters today you can reach them through their websites which are on the resource list or if you send it to us we'll be super happy to forward it to any of the presenters um, thank you so much and we look forward to seeing those of you who can join us at one o'clock and or at four o'clock today thanks <laughs>